to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Hey there, let's summon some worms. Earthworms like these might be great for my garden, but they're not great for our local forests because they're not supposed to be here. If you live anywhere in this area, virtually every earthworm you see is invasive. And slowly but surely, they are changing our forests. It's story time. About 20,000 years ago, most of the upper Midwest was covered in glacial ice. And I mean like, more than a mile of ice in some places. Virtually all the soil on the ground was scraped away, and any local earthworms were very dead. The only ones that could survive in North America at this time were the ones living beyond the grasp of the ice and cold. So basically, down south or out west. As the ice melted over thousands of years, plants did eventually spread north and east and start growing here once again. But as it turns out, seeds and spores spread much faster than worms do. So after the ice melted, the forests got here first. And for many generations and thousands of years, they grew and developed without earthworms. Now, you might know that earthworms are very good decomposers. They're excellent at breaking down things like dead leaves. This is part of why they're so great for gardens and farms. They eat food scraps and dead plant material, and all that wiggling through the ground helps keep the soil nice and loose. Well, without earthworms, the forests around here just developed a different way to live. Instead of earthworms, these forests relied on fungi and bacteria, and they're effective, although they're not particularly fast. In these forests, leaves fell off the trees faster than these decomposers could break them down. So over time, the forest floors became covered in a thick, spongy layer of plant material called a duff layer. And this was great. The duff layer acted like a cozy little blanket. It trapped moisture for delicate seedlings so that they didn't dry out. It protected little plants and even some critters from predators. And it helped keep temperatures on the forest floor more stable. And so things were for many mosquito-y generations. But what happened to those earthworms down south or out west? Surely, after the ice melted, they eventually migrated into these woods, right? I mean, it's been thousands of years, and there's some pretty nice real estate around here. Well, here's a map of the glacial ice at its peak. The ice would have killed any earthworms, so let's call this the no-worm zone. And to make things easier on ourselves, let's assume that earthworms could live anywhere outside of this zone, and that they started moving in exactly 20,000 years ago. To be clear, this is super conservative. It took the ice years to melt. And even then, thanks to things like frost and cold weather, it would have been even longer before the earthworms started migrating into this area. So super conservative, but this makes the general point. Regardless, the question is, in this time, how far into the no worm zone could they have traveled? Left to their own devices, earthworm populations spread about 16 feet per year on average. That means in 20,000 years, they could have gone about 60 miles. So, not very far at all. But yet, this region is full of worms. They're in our gardens and our yards, they're on our farms, and while they're not in every forest, they are in quite a lot of them. So, how did they get all the way up here? Well, here's the thing, they didn't. The worms we have today in the upper Midwest and most of Canada aren't actually related to the worms from down south and out west. In fact, they're not from North America at all. Instead, they're European and Asian species. They're worms that were probably introduced to this continent a few hundred years ago through things like imported plants and soil. We know this because of scientists who've identified these species, but also we kind of know this because of math. The earthworms native to the U.S. just haven't had time to get this far north in any meaningful quantity. So if you live in Michigan, or almost anywhere else in this region, 
virtually every earthworm you see is one of those non-native species. But what does this mean for our forests? For thousands of years, they grew up very successfully in a world without worms. So what happens when the worms show up? If earthworms are good for farms, surely they're also good for our forests, right? Right? To demonstrate, I need to animate something. And while I do, this is a good time to thank NordVPN for sponsoring this video. I'm gonna be a minute. So you know that thing where you search for baby shower gifts one day and then all your ads for the next month are onesies? Or where you go on vacation and suddenly all the ads you get are for local businesses? This is because online ad networks collect information about you, including about your location and what websites you visited. This is standard stuff in digital advertising, but if you don't like companies knowing your business, there are ways to make your time online more private. And one way is through NordVPN. They have two features that help with internet privacy. One is a VPN, or Virtual Private Network, which hides info about your location from websites. The other is Threat Protection, which also blocks malicious websites and some advertising trackers. One NordVPN subscription covers 10 devices, including computers and phones, and once you set it up, everything just runs quietly in the background. If this sparks your interest, you can learn more at nordvpn.com slash alexisdahl. At that link, you'll get a major discount on a two-year subscription, plus another four months for free. And also, if you just want to test it out and see what running a VPN is like, they do have a 30-day money-back guarantee. Again, you can get that deal or just test them out at nordvpn.com slash alexisdahl. Thanks for considering it. And now, I think we're done. So, the thing about worms is that they are hungry. And in a way, they're also messy. In a forest without earthworms, you have a distinct layers of soil with different properties. But when worms roll in, they wiggle around and eat stuff and mix those layers up. The exact results depend on the species. Either way, the end result in these northern forests is that the duff layer gets eaten or mixed up, and it ultimately shrinks or even disappears. And while scientists don't totally know the long-term effects of this yet, there are effects. For instance, reducing or removing the duff layer tends to decrease the diversity of native species in an area, which sometimes need a couple of years in that damp, cozy mulch before they're ready to sprout. And if native plants can't sprout, this can make it easier for some faster, invasive species to move in instead. By altering the soil, earthworms also increase the risk of drought in a forest. Without the duff layer, it's easier for the ground to dry out, which isn't the worst for some trees like oaks that can handle drier conditions, but can harm more sensitive species like sugar maples. The vast majority of maple roots are in the top few inches of the soil. So if that soil isn't protected and dries out, those maples can suffer. And actually, research has found that either directly or indirectly, earthworms do seem to be harming maple-heavy forests in the upper Midwest. So that's not a hypothetical. Finally, when worms poop, that releases a fast burst of nutrients into the forest. But again, hardwoods like maples aren't used to that. They're used to getting their nutrients slowly and steadily, thanks to fungi and bacteria. And if they're not able to absorb that sudden rush of nutrients, that valuable plant food can get washed out of the forest in the next rain. So earthworms show up, the duff layer disappears or shrinks, the soil layers get mixed up, and the nutrient balance in the forest changes. And while this might be okay for some plants, it does tend to make life more difficult for hardwood trees and some native species. Again, scientists don't fully understand all of the long-term effects of this yet. In the grand scheme of things, earthworms just haven't been around for that long. And it's entirely possible that some of their changes might be positive or just neutral. But if nothing else, it does seem safe to say that there is definite possibility 
for change, especially in hardwood forests. Now, unfortunately, once earthworms arrive in an area, they're basically impossible to get rid of. And this isn't one of those situations where you can just bring in native earthworms from elsewhere in North America. Because again, these forests evolved for no worms, period. That said, there is good news here. Earthworms are very common throughout the upper Midwest, but they actually aren't everywhere yet. There are still forests or parts of forests that are effectively worm-free. And that means you and I can prevent them from spreading. For instance, if you go for walks in the woods or go off-roading, rinse off your shoes or your tires before going to a new place. That caked-on soil might have worm cocoons in it. And if you fish, don't throw your unused bait into the woods. Fishing bait is actually a major way that worms reach new areas. Also, for people who own or manage land that's been invaded by earthworms, there are land management strategies too. Like, since earthworms can make it harder for some native seeds to sprout, land managers might directly plant baby native seedlings instead. Or when it comes to trees, they might choose to plant species that are more drought tolerant, like oaks, so that in the future, the forest might change, but it'll still be, you know, a forest. Ultimately, there's still research to be done, and it's entirely possible that different forests are responding and will respond differently to the arrival of earthworms. Forests are complex places, but as someone who used to think that earthworms were exclusively good in every landscape, I found this fascinating. As always, thanks for being here. I hope you learned something that makes you think about the world just a little differently. And I'll see you soon.